Good morning, everybody, and welcome to service this morning. It's lovely to be here. Um, it's so lovely to be here um, on such a beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Um, we are greatly blessed. Um, we might pray to start with, and then I've got a little something to share. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and ask that you prepare our hearts through worship and praise um, to hear your message today, Lord, to receive a word from you. Father God, we thank you for all those who are here this morning, and we also thank you for those lives that we will touch um, with your word um, by sending it out on um, YouTube, etc. Father, so we thank you for those platforms and we pray your protection over um, your messages that go out on those particular platforms, Lord, and we pray that those hearts that do hear them and those minds that do hear them, Lord, that would call out to you and, um, yeah, seek you out, Lord, as you are seeking them. Father God, we just pray your protection over those who are still on their way. We thank you, Lord, for each one of our church family, Lord, and we pray especially for those who are unable to be here this morning due to illness um, or that those who have to work. But Father, those of us who are here, Lord, we just want to tell you this morning how much we love you, how much we are so appreciative and grateful um, for all that you do for us, Lord. And we pray that you would just help us to help others as we go about our working week. Father, and we just pray your protection over those um, those words and those actions um, that are your words and your actions as we are your hands and your feet here on earth. Um, Father, we just uplift the, our time to you this morning and we pray that um, you would just fill this church, fill this building with your presence, Lord. Send the Holy Spirit that each one may feel a touch from you, that they would hear your word and respond um, to you with praise and worship, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you our time and our service, Lord. Amen. I just want to... And the um, scripture is Hebrews 10, 24 to 20, and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The roadway of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, very, very well known worldwide, is suspended from two massive cables. Each of the cables is three feet in diameter. So that's about a metre. Each cable consists of 61 bundles of steel wire each bundle contains 452 wires, bringing the total number of steel wires in each cable to 27,572. To the observer, it appears the roadway is suspended from two large cables, but in reality, it is suspended from 55,144 tiny wires bundled together. There is strength in numbers, a truth promoted by the Apostle Paul when he used the human body as an illustration for the body of Christ. Each cell in the human body is like an individual in the church. The faith of one member is multiplied exponentially when combined with the faith of all. Whether one wire in the cable, one cell in the body, or one believer in the church, all are important. Make sure you are an active part in strengthening the body of Christ by meeting regularly with others. And from Michael J. Wilkins, there is no insignificant member in a church. God formed us, sin deformed us, the Bible informs us, but Jesus transforms us. I just, I, um, it really, it just reminded me that we're not alone that we are part of the body of Christ and we, sh we should get together and work together, um, especially through prayer, etc. Okay, to start off, yes. Good morning. Thank you very much, 
Tony for that warm welcome. Um, and thank you, Pastor Joe and Lindsay, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity and it's lovely to meet you all. Um, so, my name is Dr. Kiara Ross. I'm a general practitioner. I'm based in Mackay. Um, I also work in fertility care medicine, so uh, in what's called NAPRO technology. Um, so this is a women's health and fertility medicine, um, which uses life-affirming techniques rather than morally questionable treatments like things such as IVF and contraception. So um, a couple of other little hats that I wear, I'm also a university lecturer for James Cook Uni School of Medicine. I work in their GP training program and have done for the last eight years. Um, and uh, as Bonnie mentioned, I'm the president of the local branch of Cherish Life Mackay. Um, and I'm also serving on the board for Cherish Life Queensland as a vice president. Thank you. Um, so my background, why did I get into pro-life work? Um, uh, pro-life issues are something that I felt strongly about. Growing up, I can remember having conversations about these issues around the dinner table. So it's, it's something that's been on my heart for a long time. Uh, and then getting into medicine, I, I would have to say that it was possibly an influence in me deciding to get into medicine. Um, and then becoming a doctor, I just felt like it was my moral duty to be involved in this work. <clears throat> Thank you. So the goals of Cherish Life are quite simple. Uh, firstly, we aim to educate all people on all pro-life issues. So not just abortion, but things like euthanasia as well. Um, and secondly, to advocate on behalf of the unborn and for our supporters. So this page is taken from the World Health Organisation website on, on abortion. Um, it opens up by saying that abortion is a common health procedure and that it's safe. We'll click to the next slide. Um, but I find these statistics quite alarming. So they claim that 73 million abortions occur worldwide each year. And that 6 out of 10 of all unintended pregnancies and 3 out of 10 of all pregnancies end in abortion. In Australia, it's estimated that one in four women will experience an abortion during their lifetime. Uh, in 2018, Queensland passed the Termination of Pregnancy Bill, um, in which abortion was decriminalised, um, and now it's legal in our state to have an abortion up to term for pretty much any reason. Um, the Queensland Health Perinatal Annual Reports came out with data between 2010 and 2020, and that stated that 1,153 late-term abortions occurred in public hospitals in our state. So this is abortions that occur beyond 22 weeks gestation, so which is really the gestation of viability. This is when modern medicine can actually keep these babies alive. 267 of these abortions occurred in 2020 alone. So over this 10-year period, late-term abortion rates have increased in Queensland by 270%, and approximately a third of these babies are born alive due to a failed abortion procedure and just left to die. So it's estimated based on these figures that in this 12-year period, 418 babies were born alive and left to die. My apologies. Um, you may be aware that Robbie Catter, MP, who's a, a champion for life, um, has just introduced an amendment to the Pregnancy, uh, the Termination of Pregnancy Act, uh, whereby he's trying to get the same rights for these babies who are born alive from a failed abortion procedure um, to any other baby that's born prematurely and that they should be able to receive life-saving treatment. Thank you. So, as members of Cherish Life and as Christians, what should be our approach to this? I think we always have to acknowledge that there is a lot of pain behind an abortion decision. It's something that couples have to live with for the rest of their life. And post-abortion grief really is a real thing. Thank you. The pro-choice pro movement, however, would lead you to believe a lie, which is that abortion is without consequences. It's the easy way out, um, but for most this is not the case. So, as Christians, um, we do not judge or condemn these women and men who've undergone an abortion. Um, we recognise that there's been a lot of suffering involved. 
But on the, on the other hand, it's not okay to just be silent on these issues either. And in fact, silence misrepresents the gospel. Jesus always taught when he walked the earth against sin, as did the apostles in their letters. And silence implies consent or approval. When we don't speak out about these ethical issues, such as abortion, especially within religious circles like churches and schools, uh, it means that young people grow up with the impression that these things are okay. So, there are really two questions that underpin the whole discussion. And the first one is, when does life begin? Thank you. So, we can look to the science of embryology for this. What is an embryo? Thank you. In 1981, there was a Senate subcommittee in the United States which introduced a bill to Congress defining person to include the unborn for the purpose of the right to life guarantee under the 14th Amendment. This lady is Dr. Micheline Matthews Ross, and she was an associate professor of medicine from Harvard Medical School. And she said, it is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception. Physicians, biologists, and other scientists agree that conception marks the beginning of the life of a human being, a being that is alive and is a member of the human species. Also on this same panel was Dr. Jerome Lejeune, and he was a professor of fundamental genetics from the University of René Descartes in Paris. And he said, to accept the fact that after fertilisation has taken place, a new human has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. Each individual has a very neat beginning at conception. In 2021, there was an article published in the Journal of Issues of Law and Medicine, in which they said that biologists from 1,058 academic institutions around the world assess survey items on when a human life begins, and overall 96% affirmed the fertilisation view. We didn't come from an embryo, we once were an embryo. This is not a theological argument, but a scientific one. So what is the biblical perspective on this? When did Jesus begin his earthly life? Well, we know from the Bible it was at the Incarnation. So this was when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Our Lady and Jesus was conceived in her womb. So the pro-abortionists have conceded the what is in the womb question. The question is no longer when does life begin, but when does life begin to matter? And this is a philosophical question, not a scientific one. Genesis 1.27 states, And God created man to his own image, to the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Um, abortion is wrong because every abortion is a destruction of God's image. Now let us consider the way that language has been manipulated by the pro-choice movement. Language shapes behaviour and thinking and it influences our culture. And when it comes to abortion, suddenly everyone becomes an expert in Latin. They, they will often refer to the unborn child as a fetus. Um, but fe fetus simply just means the offspring of a human being. Um, again, looking at language on the Medicare website, when they're talking about a pregnancy that is wanted, they will often refer to the unborn as your baby. But when the pregnancy is no longer wanted, the terminology changes. The word mother becomes woman or person, uh, which is a more recent change. Uh, the term womb becomes uterus and the term baby becomes pregnancy. So the language has been deliberately selected to dehumanise the child. Language has the power to change the culture and this is what we see now. Um, that there's just such a flippant attitude towards this issue. But nothing has changed in the eyes of God. Whether a baby is wanted or unwanted, every child is precious to him. So that brings us to the second question. What actually is an abortion? What happens during an abortion? And if you go to the Murray Stokes International website, they really do a good job at trying to hide these facts. 
their information is quite sanitary. So they say that termination of pregnancy is a safe and standard medical procedure used to end a pregnancy through surgical intervention or taking medication that causes the contents of the uterus to be expelled. We know that there's a lot more to that. Um, next slide. Oh, and, okay, thank you. We know that there's a lot more to that. And um, here you will hear from four ladies who are doctors and who are ex-abortionists. Uh, and I will talk you through the different uh, abortion procedures based on the different gestations. Um, now, I, I acknowledge that some of this information is pretty full on and can be a little bit graphic. Um, it could be triggering to someone perhaps who's experienced abortion or who maybe even has had a miscarriage. Um, so please feel free not to stay in the room if you think that that might have a negative effect on you. Um, but it is all sort of in cartoon format. So I uh, hope. I should have warned you that would be good. That's okay. Sorry. My name is Dr. Maureen Johnson. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist with 44 years of experience and I've completed over 1,000 abortions. Today I'm going to explain how the abortion pill works, which has been approved by the FDA to be taken up to the 10th week of pregnancy. Although many abortion facilities use the pill off-label for weeks after that. The abortion pill regimen consists of two steps. Step one, at the abortion facility or at home, the woman swallows methoprestone pills. Methoprestone blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When methoprestone blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off oxygen and vital nutrients to the embryo, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It's important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to stop the effects of the methoprestone and save the embryo if progesterone is administered. If the woman wants to stop the effects of the methoprestone, she needs progesterone as soon as possible. Step two. 24 to 48 hours after taking methoprostone, the woman takes misoprostol by placing the pills in her cheeks. She will experience severe cramping, contractions, and heavy bleeding to force a dead embryo out of her nerves. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding contractions can last from a few hours to several days while she could lose her embryo any time and anywhere during the process. The woman will often sit on the toilet as she prepares to expel the embryo, which she will then flush. She will even see the expelled embryo within the pregnancy sac. My name is Dr. Beverly McMillan. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist with 45 years of experience, and I've completed around 500 abortions. Today, I'm going to explain a first trimester suction DNC abortion, also called a vacuum aspiration abortion. This is typically used up to 14 weeks of pregnancy. When the woman goes to the facility for the abortion, she will lie on a table with a feed in stirrups. 
and she will be administered local anesthesia. The abortionist will place a speculum, like this, inside the vagina and open it, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix is grasped with a long metal instrument to stabilize it. A series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness, are inserted into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the fetus resides. The abortionist then inserts into the uterus a hollow plastic tube with a hole in it called a cannula and attaches it to suction. If the embryo is small enough, the cannula can be attached to a syringe and manual suction alone will remove the embryo and placenta from the uterus. Otherwise, the cannula will be attached to a suction machine. The suction machine is turned on and the abortion slowly rotates the cannula inside the uterus. The fetus is rapidly torn to pieces as it is pulled through the cannula and tubing into a large glass bottle, followed by the placenta. Sometimes smaller embryos are pulled through intact. Occasionally, the abortionist must remove the cannula and pull out body parts that have clogged the opening to complete the abortion. Once the abortionist thinks everything has been removed, she will sometimes use a long metal curette to scrape the lining of the uterus to make sure no parts are left behind. An incomplete abortion can cause infection or bleeding. Once the uterus is empty and the bleeding is under control and all the instruments are removed, the abortion is considered complete. But before the patient leaves, the tissue must be examined to make sure the placenta and all the body parts are accounted for. Two arms, two legs, a spine, a skull. My name is Dr. Kathy Altman. I'm a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist with almost 33 years of experience, and I've completed over 500 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilation and evacuation, or DNE. The DNA is generally performed between 14 and 22 weeks of pregnancy. Before a DNA abortion can be done, the cervix must be dilated slowly over one to two days with laminaria or a similar product. Laminaria is a type of seaweed that absorbs water and swells to several times its original diameter. When the woman undergoes the evacuation portion of the procedure, she lies on a table with her legs in stirrups. She may be given injections of local anesthetic in the cervix, IV conscious sedation, or general anesthesia. The abortionist uses a speculum to open the vagina and uses an instrument to stabilize the cervix. Metal dilators may be used to further open the cervix if needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, a cannula attached to suction tubing is placed inside the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on and the amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus is suctioned out. The fetus is too large to fit through the cannula, so he or she must be removed in pieces with a clamp such as this sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel and is about 13 inches long. At the tip, there are rows of teeth for grasping. The abortionist reaches into the uterus with the clamp and tries to grasp an arm or leg. Once the abortionist has a firm grip, she pulls forcefully in order to remove the limb. Piece by piece, the abortionist removes the arms and legs, followed by the head or the body, including the torso and pelvis, along with the intestines, the heart, and the lungs. The placenta is also removed. If the cervix has been overdilated, the body or even the entire fetus may be pulled out intact. Usually, the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the fetus's head, which at 20 weeks is about the size of a large plum. The abortionist must open the clamp widely to grasp the head, and then crush it so that it will fit through the cervix. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance, the fetus's brains, leaks out through the cervix. The abortionist then removes the compressed head. Any remaining limbs, organs, bone fragments, or pieces of placenta not removed through the forceps are removed by scraping the uterine lining with a large curette or by reinserting the suction cannula. The abortionist then reassembles the fetal parts to make sure that there is nothing left inside the uterus which could cause infection or bleeding. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the bleeding has been controlled, and all the instruments have been removed from the vagina, the abortion is considered complete. My name is Dr. Patty Giebink. I've been a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist for over 25 years, and I've completed thousands of abortions. 
Today, I'm going to describe induction abortions generally done from 22 weeks to term at 39 weeks. Because the child is so large and developed, an abortion procedure at this point takes two to three days to complete. And due to the risks and the need for monitoring, this procedure is generally done in the hospital or a surgery center. On day one, mifepristone is given orally. Mifepristone blocks the pregnancy hormone progesterone, causing the lining of the uterus to degenerate, starving the fetus of vital nutrients and oxygen. Mifepristone alone doesn't necessarily kill the fetus, so fetal demise is often induced beforehand. This is often only done for babies 20 weeks or older. A syringe with a large needle is filled with a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is used to treat heart problems, but an overdose of digoxin will cause fetal cardiac arrest. A long needle is inserted 